Hi, I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy, a channel about stuff that I think are neat. I am really into speaking Latin, as you may have seen in my other videos about speaking Latin. It's a lot of fun, and I highly encourage everyone who is interested to speak with others in Latin. There's a whole bunch of opportunities uh, for that, so I recommend having a look at that video, which is linked in the description. Moreover, I think it is absolutely vital that people just speak Latin. This video is going to be about the pronunciation of Latin, but the fact is people can use almost any pronunciation system that has ever existed for Latin, and we can all understand this person. For example, um, I use the classical pronunciation, as do most people who speak Latin, but there are plenty who are usually Italians who use the traditional Italian pronunciation, which since the year 1912 was adopted by the Catholic Church as the universal, or Catholic, uh, ecclesiastical pronunciation. It's, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's like talking an American talking to someone from India or England or Australia or New Zealand or other places where English is a native language. We all understand each other most of the time, um, it's, and we can figure it out. It's really not that, that different, especially because the vocabulary and the grammatical system is identical. It's merely a, a superficial difference. But though some of us, many of us, in fact, do care about trying to pronounce Latin in the so-called classical or restored pronunciation. Why would we even care? Well, I mean, why even learn Latin is another video, which you uh, should see. Um, but the language itself, grammar, most of the vocabulary has remained unchanged for about 2,000 years. And that's very interesting. The language has been able to adapt new vocabulary as necessary, which is really all it's needed. Uh, so we can talk about any possible modern topic imaginable, and that's not a problem. But effectively, since the language has remained always the same, since the classical period, it makes sense that if we can reconstruct the pronunciation, why not use it? And that's what many people think and have endeavored to do. This does not in any way invalidate the pronunciations used by all of the authors of Latin through the generations, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance, which, by the way, it wasn't just the Italian traditional pronunciation of Latin. That's just one among, gosh, dozens. Every single country in Europe, every native language that existed there also had a corresponding sound system, which was applied rather liberally to the pronunciation of Latin. The traditional English uh, pronunciation of Latin, the traditional German one, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Bulgarian, Czech, Polish, Russian. There are, are lots of these and all of them are equally valid. Some may be prettier than others, uh, but all of them are equally valid among one another. But those of us who are really going for to reconstruct not just the vocabulary and sentence structure, but really everything, we go, we want to reconstruct the classical pronunciation. Now, one of the most famous books about that is Vox Latina by uh, Sidney Allen, by W. Sidney Allen. A, and he uh, has did a lot of great things to reveal to uh, people in the 20th century how classical Latin ought to be pronounced. Erasmus really started this uh, in his uh, treatise about the pronunciation of classical Greek and classical Latin hundreds of years prior. And this, this is really the next, uh, well, I mean, not the next step, but definitely the major step of the 20th century. Now, a lot of things that Sidney Allen writes about here and here are excellent and fantastic and very good and very useful to us. A couple things, though, are absolutely wrong. And that really needs to be addressed, I think, because if we're trying to reconstruct the pronunciation, this has errors that need to be uh, worked with. The most significant errors that I note are that the pronunciation of the short letter I and the short letter U. Now, Sidney Allen says that these should be pronounced as I and U. You see from my face, I'm not very fond of that. Uh, aesthetically, they're not very beautiful, but whatever, that's not really not, not the point. Um, the point is that these sounds, for one, aren't they aren't, don't exist in Romance languages, which is telling, given that there are literally hundreds of Romance languages, not just the five major ones, which are Portuguese, Spanish, French, Italian, and Romanian, a Romance if you want to include it, 
Um, uh, but uh, there are other, we'll call them minority Romance languages, like uh, Galician and uh, Catalan, Sardinian, Sicilian, and those are, and speaking of Italy, every single city in Italy has had its own descendant of Vulgar Latin, which is in fact its own, we call them maybe dialect, but the, in reality, it's just a spectrum of somewhat mutually intelligible languages, each one of them and completely as legitimate in its own right as Standard Italian. Uh, although I think Standard Italian is probably the most beautiful language uh, in the world, and Latin right behind it, um, it's, uh, uh, these, are, these are still languages of Italy, still Romance languages. Given that I and U are not found here, that's very telling. It doesn't, that's, that's interesting. That's something we should keep in mind. Well, what languages have I and U? English, German, other Germanic languages, and I've heard them in some uh, Slavic languages as well. The point is that they're especially found in the Germanic languages, and many philologists and linguists happen to be Americans, Brits, Germans, among others, and have liberally imposed their phonological systems on the ancient language. And I think Sidney Allen's definitely one of them. Uh, it's apparent to me, uh, just by reading this text, he doesn't speak Italian fluently or other Romance languages, say, without an accent. He knows a lot about language and, and linguistics and transformations, but I highly doubt he was truly fluent in, uh, in one of those uh, Romance languages, and certainly not uh, Italian as it would seem. I mention Italian because it is, of the five major languages, the most conservative the most like classical Latin in phonology in particular. But the Sardinian language is by far the most conservative of the languages that have survived to the present day, born of vulgar Latin. Sardinia was colonized during the classical uh, period. And, we, and when we speak of the classical period, we mean essentially the first century BC, time of Cicero, time of Caesar, and many other of the Golden Age authors. That's the language that we seem to be most interested in reconstructing, not only in grammar and vocabulary, uh, syntax, but also pronunciation. Well, if that's the case, we have to consider some important things. A very important article by Andrea Calabrese, or Andrea uh, Calabrese, if I'm to anglicize it, a philologist and linguist at the University of Connecticut born in Italy and uh, fluent in, in a, a few languages, obviously English and Italian among them, has pointed out that the most conservative of the languages of the Romance languages, namely Sardinian and Southern Lucanian, or uh, Lucanian, have only five vowel qualities, which are I, E, A, O, U. And in his paper, which I'm going to link in the description, he very uh, clearly shows how such a transformation into this system, in, of the two most conservative languages, from the presumed Sidney Allen system, which has, uh, this has nine vowel sounds, which include um, Sidney Allen, the set, those nine qualities uh, are E, 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 A, O, O, U, U. It basically says and demonstrates very convincingly to me that such a transformation from that system into the one that Sardinian has is absolutely impossible. I tend to agree. And what's really interesting and important is there is in fact no evidence for two of those vowel sounds existing anywhere in the Roman period, the I and the U. As I mentioned in the companion Latin language video on uh, my Scorpio Martianus Latin language channel, please subscribe to that one as well as this one, I and U are not actually attested at all. They're reconstructed, we'll say logically, based on a certain transformation, which we see particularly in inscriptions from the first century AD. So not the first century BC, which is the true classical Latin, uh, but the first century AD. So we see these in inscription. Instead of we case, we see we case. 
instead of administrator, we see administrator. Instead of uxor, oxor. Instead of columnas, columnas. Now, the inference made by Sidney Allen and other uh, philologists who are <laughs> tend to be English, you don't hear this coming from Spanish or Italian um, native language uh, speaking philologists because it and o just seem utterly preposterous to them. They have the right intuition. Whereas to me as an English speaker, yeah, I and o come naturally in every word I say. In fact, when I speak Latin and Italian and Spanish, it's very difficult for me not to say I and o since those lax, relaxed vowels are part of my speech. But if you listen to a Spaniard, an Italian, or other people who speak these languages natively, it's very difficult for them, if my Italian friends don't mind me imitating, it is very difficult for an Italian to master the lax vowels. In English, it is much easier to use the sounds that they have in Italian. I am so sorry, my Italian friends. I'm not making fun of you. Well, I, 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 maybe I am a little. I absolutely love you. Vi voglio molto bene, come sapete. <laughs> but this is a fact of the phonotactics. Phonotactics being essentially the limitations of the sound system of a language. A great example of phonotactics in action. In Japan today, there is a sort of a diphthong, ai, for example, ikitai, which means I want to go, ikitai. In the vulgar language, in the folk uh, language, in the common language, people will say ikite instead of ikitai. Ai, if we consider that a diphthong, ai has become e. There is no intermediate step. There's no a or something else because it's not possible for the Japanese sound system. There is no a, there's no, no other, there's nothing like that. It's just I into e. And this is also true of oi, like sugoi, which means uh, cool or great in Japanese. In the slang or the common language, people will say, friends and so forth, will say among another, suge, suge. They won't say sugoi necessarily, they'll say suge. So these exist right next to each other at the same time. And there's no reason that it can't be exactly like that in the Latin of the first century. The proper diphthongs in Latin of puellae, for example, or foidus. And then more common people are kind of saying slang with each other, so they're saying puelle, uh, and they're saying fedus. Something else they're doing though, in the Latin of that uh, time period, is they're not saying aureus, they're not saying taurus, they're saying aureus, they're saying taurus. They're not saying pauper, they're saying pauper. And these are instant changes. It's a sort of a quantum leap. And that's exactly the quantum leap that Cicero attests. So here is the quote from Cicero. Uh, this is from De Oratore 346. Here's the English. If you want to hear the Latin, go to my Latin language channel and the accompanying video. For this reason, it seems to me, Sulpicius, that this friend of ours, Cotta, whose broad sounds you sometimes imitate when you drop the letter I, and pronounce a very full letter E sound instead, imitating farmhands rather than quality orators. The point of this quote is it demonstrates that Cicero recognized that rustic Latin, so not in the city, not the standard language, E wasn't being pronounced as short E anymore, short E, but was being pronounced as E, plenissimum E, he says in Latin, a super obvious E sound. Um, that is, would not be confused for i or some other weird, lax, English, Germanic vowel sound. That, for me, that's the nail in the coffin. That absolutely proves it. Such an intermediate sound isn't necessary. If we're trying to reconstruct the ancient language, stick with the orthography. If we want to speak fine, like the uneducated people of Cicero's time and the, uh, the plebeians and the foreigners and the Oscans of Pompeii of the first century AD, Okay, well, fine. But that means we have to make a lot of changes. We can't pick and choose. This is what Sidney Allen is basically doing. Sidney Allen is saying, okay, we have a nasalized final M. We pronounce the H. Um, no, those are all the stuff I had, things I advocate as well. 
uh, vowel quantity, all these things, hard, ka, and ga, right, we, we get all of that. But also, because of there's some kind of confusion in uneducated people's pronunciation of Latin, we should pronounce a short letter I as I and a short letter U as U. It's, it's, this, is, this is the odd. The grammarians, the authors, we can, we can see, and also especially from the very Sardinian language that lives to this day, uh, that these changes did not occur. They only occurred after in the first century AD, and that's the vulgar Latin. That was the common language which became the dominant Romance languages that we know and very much love. So if you, if we, well, let's say we, I don't, I don't accuse anybody here, but so let's say, all right, we want to talk like the rustic, uh, uneducated, common folk of the first century AD. Okay, we have to make some serious changes. So here is an example of, uh, well, we basically, we have three options. We can speak effectively as Cicero. We can speak at, in, or Caesar. The, we can speak with the, pro, the proper educated Latin pronunciation of uh, the Romans in the first century BC, which will include an open E, an open O, so no difference between letter E and, and letter O in, in their quality, whether they're long or they're short or anything like that. So that ends up giving us something like this. Saluete. Lucilsu et lingua latina classica loqui cupio. Lingua enin aurea est. Haud pulcrior existit. Multae lingua in mundo sunt, sed anima mea est prorsus latina. Here is how it would have to sound in the rustic pronunciation that we have well attested by inscriptional evidence of the first century AD. Saluete. So this includes the, the uh, raising of, of uh, the letter E if it's long or unstressed from E into E in quality. So saluete, saluete. Lucius, not Lucius anymore, Short U is O. Lucios son. Short U is O and final M is completely gone. Lucius son. It lengua, lengua with an E, for example, an Italian word neve, neve, snow, neve. So it's lingua, which is not surprisingly the word in Spanish. Why then do Italians say lingua? The influence of educated Latin speakers in Italy preventing this more rustic, vulgar Latin lingua from, be, from being maintained and raising it into lingua, among many others through the generations who continuously, not only in, um, in Italy, but also Spain and all the other Romance language countries, continuously re-Latinizing, re-Romanizing these Romance languages which is one of the reasons they're so similar. Take, for example, I know this is a tangent, but whatever. Uh, take, for example, the word um, in Italian, uh, altro, and in Spanish, otro. My Sp sorry, my Spanish isn't great. I'm kind of exaggerating, but so altro and otro. They both mean the Latin alter, which means other. So, okay, what we can see is there's a transformation outside of Italy, but not in Italy, and outside of Italy, of A, L, Al, into O. And in fact, this, something like this can be heard in uh, modern Portuguese. For example, the Brazilian uh, Portuguese word for Brazil is Brasil. Brasil, it's the, it's, an U sound is coming out of the L. This happens even, uh, even modern Polish exhibits this sound. So this can happen, but not in Italy, not in classical Latin, okay. Um, and also not in Italian languages. So altro in Italy, but otro in Spain. But the word for high in Latin, altus, in Italian, alto, in Spanish, alto. How did that happen? Didn't AL transform? It did. <laughs> In fact, in uh, more medieval kinds of Spanish, you find otto. But at some point, educated Spaniards wanted to re-Latinize and re, uh, to improve Castilian. So they change otto into alto. And this happens again and again in the Romance languages, something I discovered actually kind of 
recently. Anyway, so those changes, uh, so let's, so keeping that in mind, uh, here is what the pronunciation of Latin should be like in the first century, in the, uh, in the, in the first century AD, in the mouths of the uneducated, the foreigns, the Askins, the Pompeians, and so forth. Salvete lucioso et lingua latina vulgari et rostico loqui copio. Lengua any aurea est. Aurea is now aurea. Au is o. Od, this is haud before, od pulcrior existed. Existed. Short letter I is now e. Completely. There's no i intermediate. And so it's not as English speakers tend to say existed. Uh, it's existed. That transformation has to be complete. Um, there's no, no, there's no need for it. It's, uh, anyway, you've heard my argument. Multe lingue, multe lingue, en mondo sunt, sid anima mea est prorsos latina. And I previously, in uh, an older video on my Latin channel, proposed the 5th century vowel system of educated speakers, which is the seven vowel qualities of standard Italian. It would sound something like this. Saluete lucius sum et lingua latina tarda romana erudita loqui cupio. Lingua enin aureaest. Haud pulcrior existit. Multae linguae in mundo sunt. Sid anima mea es prorusus latina. Effectively, the only difference uh, between the classical Ciceronian and the late Roman Empire educated speech is making the is making a distinction in between e and e and o and o. And this is a dis and this is not necessary in the classical uh, language. So uh, these are the fundamental arguments of the Sistema Calabrese. I speak more about it in the companion video on my Latin channel, Scorpio Martianus. Please subscribe uh, there as well and, and have a look. Subscribe to this one as well. We're gonna talk more in more detail, especially if you leave your comments below with your questions, uh, your comments, your angry thoughts, this is fine. Uh, this is contradicting a lot of people. But I feel very strongly about it. I'm very convinced by the evidence, by the Calabrese uh, paper. Have a read for it yourself. Read Vox Latina. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's discuss it. And if you want, I'll make more videos about this, this topic. So uh, don't worry. I'm going to make more videos no matter what. No, nobody's going to stop that from happening. Uh, but uh, but it would be great. Let's get a discussion going, especially if you think that there's some weight behind this this argument of five vowel qualities in the classical pronunciation. Let's spread these ideas. Let's talk about them. Let's introduce them because there is a lot of textbooks out there that might need a change. If you want to hear other examples of these systems, I highly recommend videos made by my friend at Peleogloss. Um, and he has, in a couple of videos already, demonstrated these contrasts of pronunciation systems and uh, also of the Calabrese system in particular. Links in the description. And uh, just practically speaking, it is convenient if there are only five vowel qualities. Not that that is really evidence of anything, but it happens pedagogically to make it simple too. Just five sounds. Easier to do, right? But anyway, that's, that's a side note. Thanks again. Thanks for subscribing to Polymathy and also to Scorpio Martianus. And if you want to hear a Latin language podcast, listen to Legio Tertia Decima. Take care. Valete. Ixu Mari, Ixu Mari, Es longe bellius quiquis jucundius sumo daudi. Humana poines das tierras, sub solut serva de laboras. Nos tum natamus securi cantamus Ixu Mari. Ha ha ha!